James Webb Space Telescope is being billed as the successor to Hubble. When it launches, astronomers hope it will revolutionize our understanding of the evolution of galaxies, the formation of planetary systems, and even what was happening during some of the earliest stages in our universe's history. Here at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, they have been working on one of the instruments for the telescope called MIRI, the Mid-Infrared Instrument. So we've come here to meet MIRI and speak to one of the scientists who have been getting it ready for its trip into space. Paul Eccleston is in charge of the assembly and testing of MIRI at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, and I caught up with him in one of the control rooms and asked him how the James Webb Space Telescope compares to Hubble. The main difference to Hubble is this massive primary mirror that's uh, about 20 times the light collecting area of the Hubble mirror. It's uh, just over six and a half metres in diameter. So that collects the light and focuses it down to this secondary that you can see out the front here, which reflects the light back through the central um, missing hexagon in the primary into behind the primary mirror. And in behind here you have what's called the Integrated Science Instrument Module. This is the ISIM, and that's where MUI is going to sit along with the other four instruments and where the data actually gets captured in the cameras and the spectrometer um, for beaming down to the ground. This is the sun shield. This makes sure that everything that's on the, the science side, the observing side of the observatory, stays very cold. It has to be uh, 40, 50 Kelvin or so for it to operate because of the infrared wavelengths. Anything warmer than that and the emissions from the telescope would swamp the signals from the very faint objects that we're going to observe. Um, so below the sun shield, you then have the, the warm part of the spacecraft, the spacecraft bus, that has the solar arrays, the communications antennas, um, and that's permanently pointing at the sun and at the earth um, because of it being out at the Lagrange point. RAL's been responsible for um, a few aspects of the MIRI design, the mid-infrared instrument, um, particularly the thermal and cryogenics design of the instrument, and then our uh, major role in the last few years has been in the build and test of the instrument, so we provided the facilities to put the instrument together and then to do all the testing and the calibration. MIRI is being kept in a special clean room at RAL and Paul showed me around the facility which has been MIRI's home for several years. We're here in the clean room and here's MIRI, here, here it is. Uh, what's that noise we can hear in the background? So the noise is the fans that we use to keep all the air clean in here. So it pushes air through a series of filters that take out all the small particles that might be in the air and make sure that everything in here is perfectly clean. It's the same reason that we're wearing these bunny suits, the gears and the gloves and the face masks. Make sure that no particles from our skin and our hair get out and can contaminate the instrument. And this is where we've actually built the instrument from the series of subsystems that have come in from our partners across Europe and uh, the US. So um, we've put it together, prepared it, and then we've been running a series of tests and calibrations to make sure that it's going to work in space and so that we know exactly what the data means when we get the data back when it's in operation. We can see here where the light comes in. So right down at the bottom here, where that red cover is, that's the aperture. That's where the light's going to go in from the telescope. It's reflected off a mirror at 45 degrees and bounced up into the heart of the instrument. Then here in the middle, the light's divided two ways. Um, most of the light comes into what's called our imager module, which is at the lower part of the instrument. This provides the pictures and contains the coronagraph that's going to block out the light from the central star and allow us to study dust disks and gas clouds around stars and also the outer arms of galaxies. Uh, a smaller portion of the light passes through up to the top of the instrument that you can see on the top here, which is our spectrometer. Uh, this is where the light is sliced and diced and then spectrally dispersed so that we can study the composition of gas clouds. We can look at um, particular absorption features and known lines and <coughs> where they're shifted that can tell us information about how tra things are travelling, about the rotation of galaxies um, or about star forming regions. The foil that it's mostly wrapped up in is what we call multi-layer insulation or MLI. Um, this is a series of aluminized uh, plastic films which reflect the thermal radiation from the environment around um, MIRI. Um, there is another blanket which goes over the top. That's been taken off for now for us to do alignment checks because we've got um, alignment cubes and reference features on the top there that we use to make sure that it's pointing in exactly the right direction. Um, because me is looking at infrared wavelengths, it has to operate very cold. So the foil isolates the instrument that's running at 6 Kelvin from the environment around it at 45 or 50 Kelvin. Um, the other feature of the design that you can see is wrapped up in these legs. Um, it's got six carbon fibre 
hexapod structure legs. These are very strong, very stiff structures that support the weight of the instrument during launch, but isolate it from the thermal conducted heat load from the warmer environment so that we can keep it nice and cold. The one thing we had to do when we came in here was actually plug ourselves into this sort of yellow wire that's running back to that bench. Why did we do that? So the yellow wires that we have connected up are for what we call ESD grounding. This protects the very sensitive electronics in the detectors and in the um, detector electronics from any static electricity, any static shock. As we're moving around, we always generate voltages. And so if you, sometimes if you walk across a carpet and touch a door handle, you'll get an electric shock off of it. If you can feel it, then it's probably two or 3,000 volts. We've got detectors and electronics here that can be damaged by anything above about five or six volts. So to drain that charge away, we connect ourselves via a wrist strap to the ground plane. We're pretty much ready to ship Miri off. We're, um, we've just got to bag it up to protect it so that when it goes out of the clean room and into its transport container, it doesn't get dirty or contaminated. So we bag it in two separate bags and then we have a hard cover which has a particle filter on it as well. Um, and so once we've done that, we're going to be packing it into a large transport container that's cooled with dry ice to make sure it doesn't get too warm. And then we ship out to NASA Goddard. Dr Gillian Wright is the European Principal Investigator for MIRI. And I met up with her at RAL and asked her what sort of objects MIRI will allow her to study. MIRI will be used to study all sorts of different things across the whole range of things that we find in our universe, but it's got some special capabilities on JWST. One is that when we look at very high redshifted objects, so galaxies in the distant universe where their light has been made redder because of their distance, MIRI will be a very useful tool for helping us to distinguish between the different types of galaxies. And those same capabilities mean that MIRI is going to be absolutely wonderful for studying how star and planet formation happens where we know it's buried in dust. And one of the things MIRI can really do is peer through the dust and study things in detail and look at the chemistry of planet formation regions and take images of planets as well other than our own. Is there anything particularly that you yourself are looking forward to observing with Mary? Personally, I'm really excited in using MIRI to understand more about galaxy evolution. So how the beautiful spiral galaxies that we see today formed and were built up um, from much earlier, less well-structured things. And here again, MIRI's ability to look through dust and at redshifted sources is going to be really exciting. And why is it important to observe the universe in the infrared wavelengths? It's important because of the effect of the redshift. And so all of the metals, for example, that when we study how metals are built up in the universe, all of the signatures of those metals get moved to the wavelengths in the infrared. And so really, in a way, we're doing the same kind of astronomy that we do with optical astronomy, but we're doing it in the high redshift universe. How does it feel to see Miri here today at RAL, ready to fly almost? Uh, it's very emotional, <laughs> very exciting and it's wonderful, but it's also quite emotional because it's been a very long road to get here. <laughs> It'll be a few years until Miri is launched on board the James Webb Space Telescope. After launch, the telescope's mirrors will unfold, the sun shield will deploy, and celestial light will enter the instruments for the very first time. It's only then that Miri's work really begins.